Welcome to all of today's participants uh, and our program about the changing cybersecurity landscape. We have a lot of information that we want to cover today that deals in many cases with the misconceptions and incorrect perceptions that are causing tremendous vulnerabilities among uh, mid-size and other businesses. I'm Robert Pinataro from Merck and Compliance Systems. With me today is Bill White, our Chief Technology Officer. I'd like to point out that Bill has well over 20 years of experience helping companies just like yours protect their networks and their data and information from the type of theft and problems that we're seeing more and more of today. ACS has developed capability to take subject matter expertise and develop a solution that's not just user-friendly but cost-effective for many of the companies that just don't have the people or the financial wherewithal of the large company. We now would like to go into some of the ways that criminals get your information and what they're using that for. Here are some of the techniques used by criminals to develop a way to get your information. Malware is a code or a program that does malicious things. There are viruses, there's phishing and spear phishing and incidents. All of these, it's not so much necessary to know what each one is, as it might be to know that they're all designed to gain access to your data, to your information, or money in your bank account. And if I can interject one second, Robert, this is sure. by no means an extensive list either. There's, there's a lot more going on. Uh, these are just some of the ones that we're going to come across today during this discussion, so we thought it might be important just to kind of lay them out there and give you the definition. Right. And now we'd like to really talk about the perception and why that doesn't jive with what is happening in reality. This and the next couple of slides are really unbelievable by what they say. So if you look at some of the data here, almost 8 out of 10 companies say they are safe from cyber threats. Almost 7 out of 10 say they're not concerned with cyber criminals or hackers. And almost half believe a data breach or information breach would have no impact on their businesses. The next set of statistics show that they don't have in place because of what's in the first bunch of statistics anywhere near the things they should have. We'd like to draw your eye to a recent FBI study that was published in the Wall Street Journal and shows, this is found in uh, our portal, mycybersecuritydepartment.com. Just type in the words www.mysecuritydepartment.com and if you go down to the article in the lower right hand corner. This is republished from the Wall Street Journal. And what it's showing is that a recent FBI study survey has found, and we can highlight that as the second paragraph, that the bad guys are more and more focusing, and these are groups domestically and overseas, on smaller companies. And these are the very ones that we just read those statistics of how unprepared they are. And their main goal is not social discrepancy with a political view. Their single main goal is money. They're after financial gain. And this article shows how the latest approaches by these international groups of criminals are focusing on taking the money out of the bank accounts of the small and mid-sized business. 
and how they feel that that's easy pickings for many of these criminals because as these statistics on the slideshow, these are the most unprepared mm -hmm. of enterprises. Very true. Now going back to the slide presentation, part of the reason for uh, folks being so unprepared is that they typically are living in the past. And by that, on the left part of this slide, you can see a picture of a movie that came out in the 80s where Matthew Broderick played the role of someone that was just innocently mm -hmm. thinking he stumbled upon a game and had tripped into the you know national defense system and was about to start a nuclear war game. Right. Unfortunately, and there's some other numbers in, in types of events, but these are all past events. Uh, this slide is showing, again, some of the things that people say that we hear, that Bill has heard, such as, well, my company's too small. They're after the big guys. I don't have anything a hacker would want. Well, yes, you do. You have money, and your money is in your bank account, and that's what all these criminals want. They want financial gain. You also have information that if you had to try to run your business without it, you would be at a huge deficit or perhaps unable to go forward. And by capturing that which you value, a cyber criminal can ransom that. Again, what's their end goal? Money. Financial gain. They have a lot of ways to hurt you and all of us who are in the realm of a mid-sized business. And it's not about taking a credit card. More and more, and we'll see this later in the presentation, cyber attacks are not focused on entities with huge pools of credit cards. They're going more and more. Recent studies show after taking money out of your account and getting types of health and other information that they can use to get credit, get drugs, and hold people hostage for ransom. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of pull a theme together here, Robert, uh, the reason why you know these, these slides are in here is, one, it's going to build on, on our presentation. But, for example, going back to the good old days in 414s and I Love You, um, the I Love You virus, 414s was, was a gang of teenagers in, uh, in Milwaukee that uh, went war dialing, basically. They just went after some, uh, they put their modem on and went looking for what was out there on, on the, uh, you know, the so-called Internet back then. And basically, they would connect. They really didn't do too much. Uh, they went in, poked around, caused some, some, caused some trouble. But in the scheme of things, they didn't do a lot of damage. I think one of the things they did was at a cancer center, they um, made sure that some of the bills of some of the patients were reduced by a substantial amount. But the I Love You virus came out around 2000. Some of us might remember that. And the response to that was to get antivirus on your systems as quickly as possible. So we wanted to paint the picture there that a lot of small business owners today have this image of a, a, a youthful Matthew Broderick hacking into their system, not really to do any harm. And you just need antivirus and firewall. And one of the points of this presentation you'll see is to show you that that is no longer the case. Antivirus and firewall, while they're still very, very important, is not the be-all and all of cybersecurity. And again, uh, small business owners tend to think that they're not a, a target, and that's just not the case, and, and we are going to build on that. And one of the things that uh, I've done in the past is to respond to folks that have said, I'm too small, I don't have information that a hacker would want, why would they come after me, uh, or I don't take I don't take credit cards is another big one. I go in and I, I've asked questions in the past such as these. Well, if you think you're too small, do you have any employee data that's stored digitally? For example, the social security numbers, maybe their days off. Maybe they got a doctor's note uh, telling you why they were off and, and why they came back to work. That might be considered personal health information if you've got that, that data on there. Do you have any emails that you want, don't want going public? Do you have any intellectual property stored in any servers? Do you want to avoid damage to your hardware, for example, because there are viruses out there that will physically damage your hardware or do 
or embed themselves so deeply into your system that you have to scrap the hardware that you and have. And Bill, a lot of times the purpose of this is not so much that that information which a company has is that valuable that someone's going to sell it outside, but interrupting that, preventing that company from accessing it, mm -hmm. is something that is felt the company would pay a lot of right. money to ransom back. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So by messing up your system and your hardware and your ability to access files, uh, that's that's a good rationale mm -hmm. for getting ransom sure. from the company. Say, okay, we'll 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 unlock these. Mm -hmm. uh, some other things that 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 I ask is, do you want to avoid paying to get your encrypted files back, which is what Robert was alluding to. Do you want to explain in court to your plaintiff's attorney or an attorney general why you did absolutely nothing to protect your data, you didn't do due diligence, due care? And a point there, in a recent uh, seminar we just did, one of the experts uh, was discussing how even when none of the data that you have is compromised, it's never breached, it's never taken, it's never attacked, you could still be held liable and face fines, penalties, and lawsuits because more and more states, and there's a number of them now, and these were discussed in our uh, earlier webinar, which is also accessible through my safe, my cybersecuritydepartment.com. Many states now have rules on the books that the mere fact that you do not have in place proper protocols to protect that information makes you vulnerable and liable. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty important thing to understand because more and more we're seeing where attorney generals, different states, are going after companies and there was there's no breach. There's no loss of data. It's just that they didn't protect it mm -hmm. sufficiently. Right. They're being more and more proactive. Right. Uh, and another, to speak to that, California is a prime example. Let's say you're a small company and you've hopped on the, the trend of creating a mobile application for your, your, your business and you put it into iTunes or Google Play, wherever it is, so people can download it. Let's say you've paid a developer to do that. The developer did not put a privacy policy in the, in the application that, that people are downloading. Well, California says that's a no-no around 2013. They came up with their mobile app privacy guidelines, and you can be fined about a thousand bucks per download of that application if your application does not include a privacy policy. Staggering. So, some more. Just, just briefly, we'll get through this. Have you determined the impact of not being able to conduct business for a day, or perhaps a month, if you're not even prepared for a breach? It, it could, it could last days to months. And do you want to avoid being sued because the bad guys gain access to your vendor? through your network or employees. So, for example, they use you as a backdoor to get into a vendor of yours. That that uh, that does happen, and you could fi uh, suffer financial penalty for that. Now, the changing landscape, again, the reason why we put the Matthew product, Broderick slide up there and we listed out why uh, small businesses might be thinking that they're immune. There are, it's a changing cybersecurity landscape. It's an arms race between the good guys and the bad guys. But there's a lot of, of a lot of, news out there that, that tells you that you are at risk and the reason why you are at risk are some of the things that you see here on the slide. For example, hacktivist organized crime nation states, typically your, your larger corporations are going to have to fear that, but your employees, that they, they pose a big risk to your, to your, your company, not just, not just bad employees or malicious employees are the one that you fired last week. But even, even your good employees, the, your knowledgeable employees, the ones that, that, that come in every day and work hard, could be a way for bad guys to get into your Yeah, and this is systems. something that is worth just addressing for a moment. Really, with existing employees, and many, if not most of all of them, they are not out to hurt the company. What is meant by these type of issues and this group is that unknowingly, an employee can download a document, upload something, open an email, uh, not be trained enough to determine that the, and this is a very recent example, that the address for the wire transfer to send the money is looks very much like the bank we always deal with, but isn't. 
And this is something that's happening more and more and more. Uh, we recently uh, gave a number of people a study that showed uh, 10 different emails. And people were asked to rate, was that a, you know, a bad one or a good one? And how s most folks can't recognize it because there's a little, there's a letter change or space, and it looks just like something from a big bank or the bank mm -hmm. you deal with or something like that, and how it isn't, and it's redirected. So many times employees and even vendors are totally unaware, and through no fault of their own, quote, unquote, something happens. Mm -hmm. and it still creates the problem. It's still, if you're the vendor or you're the employee, creates a vulnerability, a liability for the company you're either working with, your customers, your clients, or or the job you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's very true. And and more more to that, again, we were saying an employee could be uh, a reason bad guys get in. A vendor could also be a reason the bad guys get to you. But, but what Robert was really digging into was was this whole concept of social engineering. And we put some of the common social engineering techniques there on the screen for you. One was defined earlier, and that was phishing. And that's when, just like Robert described, an email comes into your, your office or to your employees that looks like it's from your bank or it looks like it's from your vendor or it looks like it's a legitimate company asking for more detailed information. And you click on the link that's in the email, follow the link, and boom, either you get malicious software downloaded to you or you're tricked into providing information that is private to you or your company. So that's what phishing is. Whaling is the same thing as phishing, but this time they're going after upper-level management. They're going after the CEOs, the CIOs. And then phishing is a voice-related type of, of social engineering that is related to, to phishing. I just had one of these the other day where you get the phone call that says you've won, you've won a cruise or you've won <laughs> some type of vacation and you're, you're tricked into entering maybe a social security number, your address, your name, and then boom, criminals got your, your information. But basically, just know that they're, they, all, they all employ tactics that they know maybe a little bit about your company or they guess something about your company and they, they leverage that in, in an email or or via the phone. Water and hole attacks, if you picture the, the water and hole uh, in, the, on the Serengeti, in Serengeti perhaps where all the animals are gathered around drinking and the crocodile comes up and, and nabs his dinner, well that's the same type of thing. The example I like to give here is that where I live recently there was this fabulous bakery that opened up that just has phenomenal baked goods and right across the street is the, the justice center for the county. And if I was a bad guy and I wanted to uh, cyber attack, let's say, the Justice Center, I, I know that the, that the Justice Center is going to be nailed down. They're going to have the firewalls, they're going to have all their, their controls in place, where they should anyway. So uh, basically I know that that's a castle. It's a castle that's well defended, has a moat around it, and has soldiers inside. So I could attack that, I could spend my time attacking that, or I could hack the website of that wonderful bakery that's across the street because I know that a large percentage of the folks that work at the Justice Center are going to go there to look at the menu on a daily basis. So I could I could hack the site of that that uh, that bakery and then push some bad software down to the customers that are there to see them. <coughs> Excuse me. And the bad guy doesn't have to live in proximity to that. Very true. The bad guy with the same theory could go find where are all the restaurants and donut shops around my target. Mm -hmm rationalizing that most likely a good number of the people working in my target mm -hmm. will go there. Right. Then the last part, part, part of this slide, we talk about ransomware. Ransomware came about around 1989. There was a piece of ransomware out there called the Age Trojan, and the writer of the, the code for the Age Trojan basically had to go in and encrypt files on, on computers, and then in order to unencrypt files, you had to pay, I think it was $189 or something like that back then, to, to unencrypt it, and this, this person that wrote this malicious code was then going to donate the money to AIDS Research. So he was proved to be, to be mentally ill. He, it seems like he was a type of hacktivist at the time where he was doing something for the, for the greater good. 
he was doing something malicious for the greater good, but in fact, uh, he was a bad guy. Um, and then we had an uptick in ransomware in 2005, and then again in 2013 with the introduction of CryptoLocker, and that's where most of you might be familiar with ransomware. It, what happens is, if in the case of CryptoLocker, it goes in and encrypts your files, and then you get a message saying that your files are encrypted and you can't get them back until you pay money through Bitcoin, which is really untraceable. So they, they will unlock your your data, they will unencrypt it if you pay them. So. Well, and, and there is part of the changing landscape. In 1989, an individual designed something to encrypt files that you would pay him money, mm -hmm. and his purpose, though, was to aid in medical research. Mm -hmm. Well, today, the landscape is there are criminals all over the world who are looking to gain access to your systems and the systems of, of companies to encrypt the files so that they can ransom them back. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there was a recent uh, program that showed how these gang networks, who are very sophisticated and have very sophisticated tools, will allow people to rent and use their tools to extort mm -hmm. money yes. in this. And they show them how to go into business. Sure. And it's the most amazing thing that it, 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 they're out there marketing, rent our systems, and make all kinds of big right, money. Right. So they have every way to enlist help and support probably of a lot of people that that was maybe never on their mind to be mm -hmm, a criminal. Sure. Might not even have the wherewithal to do this. But if you provide the tools, mm -hmm. it's like going the criminal business yourself right. and look what you could make. Right. It's the new franchise franchisee. You're not you're not open up McDonald's or Burger King, you're open up a, a, a hacker uh, a hacker uh, company. Yeah. yeah. It, it's it's unreal. And and the numbers here are staggering. Robert and I have, have mulled over these numbers before that they're just mind blowing from Quarter 1, 2012 to quarter 1, 2013, ransomware attacks doubled, and McAfee actually reported in, in, in Q1 of 2013 over 250,000 incidents of ransomware alone. And this is just one company that has a very small piece of the market. Mm -hmm. When you add up all the McAfee and McAfee-like companies out there, and they had 250,000 of these in one quarter, mm -hmm. You can imagine how many millions there are really that are happening. Right. This is this this next slide comes from a partner of ours, Net Diligence, which is a, a global company that deals with cybersecurity and really focuses on on risk mitigation and also more importantly, breach response. It's a it's a it's a wonderful organization, great people, very knowledgeable. But they said in a recent ACS webinar. Uh, the slide here, these were preliminary 2014 numbers. The final numbers won't be out until the fall, most likely. That the hackers were the most frequent cause of loss, which is about 30%, 32%. Malware and viruses were 15%, and rogue employees were 12%. Now, just so you know, included in, in those numbers, we, we, we see a specific number for a rogue employee at 12%. 12 but if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, you see staff mistakes as part of it, uh, paper records, theft of hardware. So, so people play an important role in the cause of loss of data. It's not just hackers sitting remotely dialing in and taking data. They're, they're tricking your employees into, into helping them exfiltrate the data. And that's so. probably an operative word that these employees aren't bad employees. They're tricked mm -hmm. or compromised in some way and are unknowing. Also, we should point out that with regard to these slides, they come from claim claims made by two insurance carriers. Mm -hmm. So uh, the presumption that we have to deal with is that there was an insurance policy in place mm -hmm. to make a claim against. And right now we would like to point out that one of the things we strongly recommend is that you evaluate with your insurance agent mm -hmm. the need and the scope of cyber insurance. For many of the mid-tier and small companies, it is not very expensive and gives you coverage for things such as evaluating how to restore your hard drives, your your computers, your equipment, how to deal with some of the records that may have been compromised or destroyed. Mm -hmm. 
which are out-of-pocket expenses that can make or break a company. True. And uh, we'd like to really, really stress that throughout the program uh, and for also point out that while ACS works with many in the insurance arena, many agents and uh, agencies, we do not market or sell insurance. Our purpose is just really to work with the insurance agent and you and help them help you get to the best place. Mm -hmm. And before we jump to the next slide, uh, I think uh, last I saw, I'm not too sure on the numbers, so I don't want, to, I want you to take this you take this with a grain of salt, but I think it was about 30% of uh, some loss was coming from ransomware. I saw that in a different report that came from a different company. Again, the, the, the study that we're looking at now is just based on uh, a portion of some companies that have insurance. That's where those numbers yeah, are coming and, from. And something to point out, there's all kinds of studies, and a new one comes out every day. Yep. The important thing is the landscape is changed and is changing rapidly because the worldwide networks of bad guys are after more and more mid-sized and smaller businesses. Mm -hmm. And the statistics will show that and are starting to show it and studies like the FBI survey show it. And these are the leading indicators mm -hmm. of where the market's going because unprotected as we saw on the other slides and there's a few more studies that we'll, we'll show through mm -hmm. this is really the easy pickings mm -hmm. right and and that that's a it's a great great point you just made and just realize about the changing landscape if you look at the on this slide the number that that for for malware and virus that the, the losses that come from malware and virus I don't want to say only but it's only 15 percent so that, that's an example of the changing landscape. <laughs> what about the other, you know, the other uh, 80, 85 percent that, that's not coming from a virus? How do you protect against that? It's not and your that, antivirus isn't going to help you. And that's good, too, because I know, Bill, on some of the programs that I participate with you doing, people say, oh, well, I have antivirus mm -hmm. software. Right. So unprotected. Right. It's one of the other things you hear. Or I have cloud storage mm -hmm. unprotected. True. And the answer is you have a bit of protection. But you are still hugely vulnerable mm -hmm. and really need to know it. Mm -hmm. Just having uh, malware software or record stored in some other place or in the cloud doesn't cover it. True. Uh, the next slide, some, some numbers that we just want to throw at you. Again, we're not going to bore you here with numbers, so we'll go through these quickly. But 2014, according to, to Lake Spring, was the highest you're on record for cyber attacks. Scary, scary number at that first bulleted point. Seventy-two percent of attacks against companies were uh, against companies were companies under 100 employees. And yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, the that is the staggering number, and shows. I mean, under 100 employees. This is a Verizon study in 2012, and the pace is picked up. And why? We saw in the earlier slides, mm -hmm. most 8 out of 10 businesses don't think they're vulnerable. Right. They've taken no steps to protect themselves. Well, the bad guys have latched onto that. Mm -hmm. They're reading the statistics going, why should I attack the, I think you had used the analogy before, the strongly defended castle mm -hmm. or, or fortress. Mm -hmm. I could go easily walk down the street conceptually right. and take money out of all these people very easily. Right. Very easily. With very little risk. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and a lot of times, if you, if you picture the, the hacker just targeting your company, going to, to your servers and targeting, that's not necessarily true. It can be automated. So you know, it doesn't have to be the hacker sitting there spending his time going after your little company. It could be something that's automated. Some other number seven months is the average time it takes for an organization to realize they've been attacked. And 84% of those, those breaches have been evidenced in, in logs on the servers or on the network devices like a firewall. 90% of small to medium-sized businesses don't protect their data, which is scary. 45% of small businesses targeted in spear phishing attacks. Spear phishing is a type of phishing attack against phishing is when you get the spam email that says you need to update some information, click on the link, it's your bank, trust us, and then they take you to a malicious site or force some software down onto your, your system. Spear phishing is they know a little bit about you. 
they might know what bank you actually use. So the email coming to you has the bank header, has some, some text that maybe was taken from the bank website. Uh, they might know your name. They might know a coworker's name. So it's a little more targeted than a phishing attack, and they are becoming more common. And then another scary number, 60% of small businesses can't survive a major breach. Years ago, this was one of those... Those, uh, those numbers that people threw around, and it was sort of like an old wives' tale. But it's true. Uh, it's one of the, the things that we, we found out recently just by um, aggregating information from different reports is that that, no, that number does hover around 60% of small businesses can survive. And one of the breach. key things here to be aware of is especially the nature of the current environment where more and more they're looking and monitoring your bank account mm -hmm. because of data, something transmitted to you that they're now able to monitor that. And they could tell when you have the most money in that bank account. And that's a large part of what they're after. Mm -hmm. Maximize them when the money's in there, take right. the money out of the bank account. Right. There is no protection for that by the banking system. The Commercial bank accounts are not protected from cyber theft mm -hmm. in, in, in any way. And so you really need to have a insurance policy mm -hmm. or, at a minimum, in place protective measures to determine this. Mm -hmm. uh, much of what our solution brings uh, is a way to determine and to even install a device mm -hmm. that will, among many, many things, 24-7, monitor your logs, monitor your information, right. and report immediately with flags and bells and whistles through a dashboard that something's going on so that you're not seven months out. Mm -hmm. And now somebody sees the pattern of when you have the most money in the bank, right. or normally you have five, ten thousand, and all of a sudden you've got a hundred thousand because of a project mm -hmm. or something, and the money's gone. True. And we're seeing more and more and more of that from property management firms where escrow money is being taken to those companies that were small businesses that are mentioned in that Wall Street Journal article that we introduced earlier. And they can tell probably just as well as you and your accounting department when you have the maximum amount of money mm -hmm. in place and they're there. Mm -hmm. Very, very uh, problematic situation. Right. And just to, just to bring up a, a term that's being used here on this, this slide, which is kind of new, the word breach. There, there was a slide previously that we, we just kind of glossed over where it, it, there was a definition of an incident versus a breach. An incident is something that occurs that's security related or affects what we call the CIA, confidentiality, confidentiality uh, integrity, or availability of, of your data or your, your systems. So a, a breach could be, I'm sorry, an incident could be a virus. Uh, an incident could be just a hardware failure. But a breach is something that's a little bit different. A breach is a type of incident that, that occurs and that sensitive information has been exposed, seen by unauthorized personnel, been exfiltrated from your company. So the definition of breach will vary from state to state. Definition of breach will vary from you know insurance carrier to insurance carrier. But just know that, that um, however breach is de defined by your state or your insurance carrier, that's going to determine how you react to a breach. It's going to determine time frames. It's going to determine forensics. It's going to determine who you have to notify and by when. So it, it, it's really a big, big component. Of and, and this is an excellent point because, and one of the main reasons why we have included in our cybersecurity solution a response team mm -hmm. that is available if and when a customer on that system, on that program, is breached. Right. Because like so many things, it's when the you-know-what hits the fan. How do people respond? How can they respond as a mid-tier business without the wherewithal right. to do that, right. without the ship sinking? Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll cover the program and some of the key features of it uh, in a little bit. So some other numbers continue. We don't want to get hung up on numbers, but the average data breach cost in the U.S., I think this is for 2013, uh, was $3.5 million. Notification cost was over half a million. The, the per record, it's hard to give a, a per record cost. So for each record that was actual traded or, or breached, 
uh, about $277 per record you're going to spend. We, we've seen numbers anywhere from two cents to up to $35,000 per record that was breached. And that depends on fines and penalties. It depends on the number of records that were breached. There's a lot that goes into that number. That's why it's hard to nail and down. And also what has to be remembered by that, these, these hits of, of data are derived from entities that are reporting. Mm -hmm. Most of the small tier businesses are not reporting. Mm -hmm. So most of the problems are just off the scale by way of records. They are not in this. Uh, sometimes people look at this and say, well, wait a minute, three and a half million, that might be more revenue than I have. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not more revenue than the big guys have. And again, the statistics that we're seeing are tilted a bit towards the higher end because those are the ones that make the news. Those are the ones that have had the insurance and had the claims mm -hmm. and made all the headlines. What we're now seeing is countless hundreds of thousands of mid-tier businesses being impacted, and they never report. Right. So that's really, I think, a part of seeing the trend, but also the takeaway from this. Right, right. And another takeaway, too, is, is to realize this is why 60% of small businesses can't recover from this because it's a huge hit to companies, uh, the, these, these, these numbers. And, and more importantly, this isn't mentioning the public relations disaster, the loss of, of business, the, the following days you discover, the, the media days after the breach where you're trying to regroup and rebuild your infrastructure and find out what happened, plus the public relations disaster where you're losing customers for you know maybe months or years down the road. So it, it's, it's huge. It really is a huge. And, and, we, and we, we, we kind of want you to focus on, too, about government regulatory fines. Maybe you've got industry fines. PCI is one of the bigger ones, the, the payment card industry. Uh, we've seen an uptick in lawsuits and fines by federal and state agencies for companies that don't protect data. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Robert brought that up. You don't necessarily need a breach. Uh, but I would like to bring a personal story from here, one of one of the, the customers that we work with, that I've worked with, uh, a massage, it was a masseuse, it was a massage parlor with several masseuse, masseuses, and uh, we, I was discussing PCI compliance with them, and they said, oh, you know, we, we are, we, we, we pay our, our fees to PCI, we do take the credit cards, and then, and I said, well, what about the compliance, and the owner said, well, we've got this big questionnaire to fill out, but, you know, it's kind of overwhelming, we don't, we don't fill it out. Uh, PCI charges charges us for not, not filling that out. So, you know, it wasn't really that they're flippant or they're just dismissing the need to do that. They're, they're overwhelmed by what needs to be done. They don't know who to, hurt, who to turn to. But more importantly, they don't know that just because they're paying PCI for their lack of, of filling out this application on their own, um, because they're not taking the appropriate steps, they might be open to even more fines and penalties once they're breached. And therein really lies, and the farmer's insurance commercial. Mm -hmm. What you don't know can hurt you. Right. And this is such a clear example of a thinking that, oh, gee, I'm not vulnerable there. Or, okay, I, I, I paid a little something or did a little something, and now I'm protected. Mm -hmm. Or I have antivirus, or, and on and on and on. And that's what we really want everyone to know. There is a way to assess and identify how and where you're vulnerable and implement affordably a good solution to offer a great deal of protection without breaking the bank mm -hmm. or the budget. Uh, but what we're really strongly suggesting too is that everyone loses that perception of it's not me, it's not going to be me, because more and more Many of the professionals in this industry say it's not a matter of if, but when. Mm -hmm. So what are the bad guys after? We've talked about this. One of the things they're after is data, and we'll see this in a minute. Again, again it's mainly for financial gain. But uh, the, the, the different types of data that they're after falls into these three categories. You have protected health information, which you might be familiar with, especially familiar with, with, with HIPAA, the Health Information Portability Act. Uh, just as an example, it could be name of a customer, uh, sorry, name of a patient, medications that they're taking, uh, the hospitals that they visited. Basically, it's their 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 medical record. Uh, that's information that, that they're after. And and back to this this the, the massage parlor that I was speaking of earlier, uh, 
they didn't really realize it, but they were collecting person protected health information because when their customers came in for massage, they had to fill out a, a questionnaire, and on that questionnaire was their name, their address, their email address, and uh, any surgeries they've had plus the medications that they're currently taking. Yeah. That, that's protected health information, and they didn't—they weren't aware of it. They were writing it down on a piece of paper, leaving it on the on the desktop, and then putting it in the computer later on. And also, this past weekend, the Saturday, August eighth, in this edition of the Wall Street Journal, front page article on crooks use stolen personal data for medical care, drugs, and victims get the tab. Mm -hmm. And this article goes into how more and more this type of information is being uh, compromised, sold, and used, and the terrible problems that the individual whose information is taken and used in a variety of ways, uh, the problems they face. Mm -hmm. And the lawsuits are breaking out and the cost of this. So it's become a very, very big problem. Again, why? The bad guys are out for financial gain, and they're going to rob or steal or break into or get that the places where it's easiest. Mm -hmm. And more and more as the big entities start implementing robust solutions, the bad guys are going downstream. Mm -hmm. Other types of information, uh, other types of data, personally identifiable information, PII. Just so you know, just like with breach, uh, the definition of breach differs from from state to state, possibly, or insurance carrier to insurance carrier. Same thing goes with personally identifiable information that does vary. Uh, Forty-seven states and territories have different definitions of what PII actually is. But PII, for example, would be a name and social security number, possibly your driver's license number, bank info. Some states it could be your 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 account information, maybe login ID, your email address, password, that type of stuff. Also on this, what folks have to keep in mind, and this was brought out by uh, one of the experts in, an, in another webinar, is that it's not just the state that you do business in, mm -hmm. but it's the state where your customers are. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're in a state surrounded by three or four other states and you have customers who are in those states or have moved to those states, you are responsible according to the rules and laws of those states. Mm -hmm. And this is something that most people are just totally unaware of. Uh, yeah, that stresses the importance of, of a breach coach or a breach attorney, which we'll, we'll talk about shortly. But basically, it's it's an individual that's knowledgeable in the laws of, of, the, of the different states and and different, uh, you know, industry regulations and so on that you refer, that you contact after a breach has occurred. And we will talk about that. Another type of data that they're after is payment card industry information, your, for example, credit card numbers. So you, you're probably most familiar with those as a, as a business owner. Again, net diligence claim study, this is based on the companies that have insurance that responded to, um, you know, questionnaire that was given. Uh, what net diligence found is that the, the folks that they polled Personally identifiable information was the most frequently exposed data at 44% of the claims, followed by PCI at 29 and personal information at 12. And, and also it should be pointed out that that personally identified information also includes medical and some health information. Mm -hmm. So it's not that it's only got to be personal health. Health information is included under the, the umbrella also right. personally identified. So what else are the bad guys after? We, we've been speaking about this since the beginning of the, of, the, of the presentation. Financial gain, you have cyber extortion, which basically says, I'm going to release the photos of you if you don't pay. Uh, Ashley Madison is a great example of, of this. It's the that site where folks go that, that want to tryst and they're married. Um, that, that was breached recently. Ransomware, we've spoken about that. For example, I'm not going to unencrypt your documents until you pay me. Bank account and vendor info. We know we know of a customer where one of the office employees clicked on a link. They thought it was for their bank. They went to the to the supposed bank site, typed in the information, and then ninety grand was gone from their account within a few days. So they're after that type of info. That can be done numerous ways, like a key logger. It could just be re redirecting you to a different site 
where you're, you're tricked into putting your information in. Diversion is something that people aren't real familiar with but found out, and that's when they get into your maybe your Amazon order and have the, the, the order actually directed to their, their P.O. box instead of your front door. Catching bigger fish is another reason why the bad guys do it. For example, we talked about this earlier where they go through you to get to maybe the payroll company that you use. So your data itself is not important, but your access to the payroll company, which has the good data, is important to them. And then they want to sell data that was actually traded from your, your systems. And, and there, there are actually sites out there, and government agencies are working to shut these down, but there are sites out there where you can go to sell your lists that you've collected of personally identifiable information or credit card numbers. Uh, that, that really does happen. But also they after, uh, again, just for mischief, mischief, mischievous reasons to cause harm, they want to disrupt your network or your Internet communications. Don't dismiss a, a, let's say a local or regional competitor of yours, don't dismiss the possibility of them hiring somebody for a low cost to maybe do it with this, what's called a denial of service attack or a DDoS or a DOS attack on your system. It's easy to do, it's very cheap, um, and it can happen, but basically they're, they're doing this to cripple your, your network. This is interruption. We spoke about physical damage. There are viruses that can damage your, your hardware either directly or get so deeply rooted into the systems that you actually have to discard them and start fresh. Diversion, again, is another tactic that we talked about. And then for us, because ACS also deals with uh, workplace safety and OSHA issues and risk mitigation, uh, industrial control systems or, or SCADA, which is your supervisory control and data acquisition, those systems, some of those systems could be 30 years old or 20 years old, and they were not designed to be Internet-facing systems. And so they use protocols that were not safe or not secured and they can be hacked and controlled and so on. So these pose health risks for your employees if you're using these types of things. Again, it could take your system down and you're out of business for a couple of days while you try to regroup. But just know it doesn't always have to be about getting personally identifiable information or health information. There are other reasons why they will hack into you. So what to do? This is, this is uh, can get pretty mind-boggling and mind-blowing as we get into this. We're not going to get too detailed, but please know that there's an easy way around all of this. You can turn to folks like us uh, who, who know about um, risk mitigations, particularly surrounding the cybersecurity world, and we can get you to where you need to be. And what this really shows is ACS has developed a defined methodology. Mm -hmm that is at the heart of what our solutions bring that identify the risks and vulnerabilities and then follow with how you prepare, prevent, and respond to them. Mm -hmm. And that's really, in essence, the solution uh, to a lot of this. Uh, the, the capabilities that we've developed, moreover, allow this solution to be something that is priced at a range and availability that makes it available mm -hmm. to the many because it is cost effective. It is something that can be uh, implemented and maintained without requiring legions of people and hundreds of thousands of dollars of expense. Mm -hmm. True. So the, uh, again, what Robert's saying about the methodology is that there are, there are 101 ways, 101 methodologies that you could employ to help you identify your risks and mitigate your risks and vulnerabilities um, on a cybersecurity level. So we came out, you know, we were sitting around thinking, what's the easiest way to kind of get our head around this and, and help our customers get ahead around it? And if you break cybersecurity down into the three phases of, of action where you prepare for a breach, um, it will happen. It's not a matter of if but when. You try to prevent a breach, and you might say, well, if you're telling me it's, it's just a matter of if and not when, why would I need to prevent? What's the purpose of it? Um, there's something called the, the 20 top critical security controls. These are things that you implement or do to, to prevent the bad guy from getting to your data or to your systems. About 80% of attacks can be thwarted or prevented by, by addressing those common security controls. Uh, again, that leaves 20% that are still out there to hit you. So you, you have to prevent. You have to prepare because it's, probably, it's, it's most likely going to happen to you. You have to prevent. 
and then you also have to, to respond. So antivirus and firewall kind of falls under that prevent and, and building on the scheme of changing landscape, you have that, that leads to what you do to prepare and to respond. And we'll, and we'll, we'll address that as we, uh, we move in here. Um, so again, don't be overwhelmed. Just know as we're going through this that ACS has developed its five, five steps to cybersecurity. Um, and this comprehensive security solution, A, is easy to implement. So, for example, we've got a crisis support team that's going to help step you through this, particularly after your breach. We have experts that lead you through the process, for example, what plans and policies you have to implement. Uh, it's really seen as a safety net. We have state-of-the-art technology, uh, particularly at certain levels of our subscription. You get what's called a unified security management system, sort of an all-in-one way to protect your, your digital assets to protect your people, your, your devices, your hardware, your network. And that is 24-7, it's around the clock, and that includes the support and updates. And then it is very budget friendly. We, we, we know that we're working, our target market is, is small to medium sized businesses. And, and that's been a very, very underserved demographic in the cybersecurity world. Everybody wants to get into Target and sell them their solutions. Everybody wants to get into to eBay or or, or to Sony and sell them. Uh, nobody was really recognizing the need for small businesses to be protected. So uh, we're very we're very proud with, of what we've done with our with our subscriptions. We brought together some some partners that play in that big space with the, with the targets and so on. But recognize what we were trying to do for the small businesses and help design a package for you. And that's starting at under 150 bucks a month. We can get you a, a good uh, subscription that helps you, uh, you know, sort of get go through the maze of, of cybersecurity right. risk and, mitigation. And what it also does is it provides for implementing and maintaining a very good posture and defensive posture right. program that will nip many of these things in the bud, avoid a number of the top 20 uh, uh, occurrences and vulnerabilities, and more, very importantly, give you the ability in, to work with your insurance agent to get a cyber insurance policy that offers the best coverage by mm -hmm. breadth and scope of what it should be based upon what your business does and what your business is likely to encounter. Mm -hmm. Not that the credit card information is stolen, but that the data is corrupt right. or the money is taken out of the bank account or I may have to reconstruct my records. Those are the key essences of where many companies are vulnerable and the policies can well be tailored mm -hmm. to that. And so again, we work with you and your agent to help you have the best pricing and the best coverage. So what to do in this changing landscape? If, if it's not just antivirus and not just firewall, what are we supposed to do? Well, in order to mitigate the risks. And, and what Bill's now describing, too, are the individual pieces of that chart. When our subscription program is implemented, it gives you right. these, these aspects, exactly. these coverages. Exactly. So, so, so what to do? Again, the first step of our, our, our three-step methodology was be prepared for your incident or breach. So you have to, to know what you need to protect. You have to know what the vulnerabilities are of those assets. So asset identification is a huge uh, piece of, of this changing landscape. You have to know what you have for data, hardware, software, etc. There are software, there's software that can do that for you. Our solution does it for you. Uh, you can hire a company that does uh, risk assessments that will do this for you. So there's numerous ways to do this, but basically you have to know what you have and know what the vulnerabilities are. Then once you do that, you can create your plans, policies, and procedures. So very important today's changing landscape. Incident response plans, what to do when something happens. Again, if there's a breach, your state probably dictates how, how soon you have to notify your customers. Um, so who gets involved, who do you call, what to do, what steps to take. Uh, business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans. So there's, there's a whole bunch of IT security plans that you're supposed to, to create um, uh, for, for your business. Now, not all of them apply to your business. Uh, most will. Do you have to do all of them? It's an extensive list. We have one in our, we have a list of what you're supposed to do in our security matrix, which is part of our, 
or, or subscription. But the point is, you can't do nothing. You need to do something. For example, you, you should at least have a password policy for your company. You, you should at least have a disaster recovery plan. For your and company. in guiding uh, every customer uh, through this, we help them identify of all of those that are needed, which ones do I rank number one, two, three, et cetera, mm -hmm. and why. Right. So if you can't get to all of them, which is the key one I should do like right now mm -hmm. or be aware of? Right. So again, you, as a small business owner, medium-sized business owner, please do not discard the need for, for policies. Um, educate your employees. We've kind of been hammering that home since the beginning of the presentation. Educate employees is a big piece of protecting your data. Uh, retain a breach code or attorney. So again, these are folks that are going to, you're going to get them on the phone the, notice, the, the, the second you notice that you have a breach. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that your, your antivirus software discovered there's a virus. That, that's really not a breach. It, it's, it's more of somebody got into the system, they've had access to the database that contains your customer list. And something else here, we've been talking about many of these things that need to be done by way of protection. and more and more entities that you and your company deal with are starting to very rigorously look at the levels of protection that their partners, their vendors, their contractors and subcontractors have mm -hmm. because they, they realize their system can be corrupted because you don't have the proper controls in place. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming... Uh, more widespread, and we think that trend will, will really continue. We've seen it in, in, in other industries with workplace safety, where a contractor who has hired subcontractors uh, is requiring proof of a robust safety program or even having an entity audit mm -hmm. the, the, the robustness, if you will, of their safety program. And very similar things are happening here uh, with regard to the evaluation of a partner or vendor's cybersecurity program mm -hmm. because your those relationships just don't want to and can't afford that they get infected or they have a problem because you didn't do what you should right. do at a minimum. Right. So to be prepared, retain the breach coach or attorney or a privacy attorney uh, before the incident happens as part of this, this our methodology. Be prepared. Same with your forensics experts. These are the people that are going to be your first responders that get in and look look at the systems, determine what was what happened to them. They're going to establish a chain of custody, chain of custody, for example, of, of the hardware that was hit. Take images of what happened. So uh, again, the point is is that you want to do it before it happens. You don't want to call these people up the day. It and occurs. realizing that most of this is beyond the capabilities of many of the companies, we have this whole mechanism incorporated into our base solution mm -hmm. so that when something happens, if and when something right. happens, you have the availability of all these experts. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, do I have to go get a lawyer and a law firm and put them on a retainer and I can't afford that. All of these are to make you aware our solution brings simplicity to it mm -hmm. and does it for you. True. Frequent backups with longer retention policies is another way to be prepared. And then the ever important cyber insurance. We get, we, we're not in the insurance business, but we work closely with folks who are. And this is a properly uh, written policy. It can save you a ton of money, a ton of headaches, and a ton of time. What else to do? This is the second part of our methodology to prevent the incident to breaches. So you implement the controls defined in the policies that you wrote in the prepared section. So another reason why it's important to write your policies out because those policies include what you need to do to mitigate the risks. And again, you don't necessarily have to mitigate every single risk. You know, that's impossible for a lot of companies, but you have to do something. So we're going to talk more about these controls in a minute as part of the changing landscape. Antivirus, and your, and your firewall is included in implementing controls defined in your policies. But there's more to it than that, again, because of the changing landscape. You've got to use strong passwords. Typically, it depends on where you look on the Internet, 8 to 10 characters. You definitely want to use a mixture of upper and lower case and, and symbols and so on. Antivirus and anti-malware. Um, antivirus is a type of malware. Adware is a type of malware. So you need those. You need your firewall. Again, educate your employees. 
encrypt your data at rest in motion and it use at rest as much as just sitting on the hard drive uh, in motion is for example if you change if you're sending it over to a USB stick or if you're more importantly sending it across the, the the network or the internet and then in use is when the computer is actually using it so most companies will go after when it's at rest and, and in motion to try to encrypt it there whitelist this goes back to identifying what you have you want to identify what's good you want to say this is the software that our computers are allowed to run so you whitelist your software uh, people are bringing devices from home. Well, you want to make sure that the device that they're bringing from home should be and is allowed to be on the network. So you can whitelist your hardware. You can even whitelist email. For example, if you have a certain uh, domain that you keep getting email addresses like uh, you know buymedsheer.com, you can whitelist them. Actually, you put them on the blacklist to say that they're not allowed. But more importantly, you would whitelist approved uh, senders. And then, and then lastly, what else can you do? You can secure what's called harden your operating systems or your, or your devices and make sure that they're patched with the latest patches or hot fixes. Uh, I know for some companies you don't necessarily want to roll these things out the, the minute the, the patch is, is put out and available, but uh, there might be some testing involved. But you've got to get it on there as quickly as possible. You should have a patching policy. Uh, again, that was in the prepare section. You should have a, a hardening policy that sh that's in the, the, um, uh, the prepare section as well. And then here's some of those important controls that we were talking about. So in addition to the antiviral software, uh, anti-malware, in addition to your firewall, what should you do? This is an extensive list. I'm not going to get into all of it. But just please, again, realize that, that we have a solution for you that includes all of this. So you don't have to do all of it. You need to do at least some of it. For example, SIM event coordination. That's that's looking at logs. You need to go in. So this this ransomware. If if antivirus isn't going to catch it, how do you know what's happening on your system? One of the ways is you look at the firewall logs. You look at the server logs. That takes people. It takes manpower. It takes time away from other things they could be doing. Um, but it's something that you need to do. Incident response. Uh, behavioral monitoring, that, that's also uh, something to look at. For example, it, it's not the necessarily the behavior of your employees, but let's say you installed an application 20 days ago, and now all of a sudden it's acting differently. So the behavior of that application changed. You want to monitor that. Again, there's, there's software out there that will do that for you. There are hardware devices that will do that for you. Threat detection, this is your intrusion detection systems, and you'll see their NIDs, HIDs, and WIDs. That's your network intrusion, your host intrusion, and your wireless intrusion detection systems. Um, you should have a combination of these or all of these. Uh, basically, the hardware, the, the host intrusion detection system will sit on your server. It will look for abnormalities or anomalies that happen on the server and alert you. Again, things outside of antivirus, like if a hacker gets in. Network, self-explanatory, looks at the network. Uh, wireless, looks at the wireless ne uh, network traffic. And then file integrity monitoring, yet another way, for example, to help you with your ransomware. This looks for changes on files on, on um, your workstations or servers. Vulnerability assessments, we can't speak enough about these. Again, you have to identify what you have first, and then you have to, to identify the vulnerabilities of those assets. So there's continuous vulnerability monitoring. There's something called authenticated, unauthenticated active scanning. But just, just realize that you need to kind of audit or do an assessment of what you have and what, what vulnerabilities there are. It can be done manually, which is could really be a tough thing for, uh, you know, a company with 10 or 15 people. Um, but there's automated systems. Uh, again, there's some that are included in our solution. Asset discovery, we talked about that. And then a good forensics toolkit, which is uh, what helps you find out what happened and get that chain of custody and um, help you design your controls to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, again, that's, it's a big list. We could speak days on end about each one of these. Just know that you can get these things piecemeal uh, out on the Internet. Some are open source. Some are, are proprietary. Just know that uh, we, we, have a syst we have a solution that, that includes basically everything you see there. And then lastly, for our, our methodology, how do you respond to an incident or a breach? Again, you must in today's day and age, you must contact a breach coach immediately. Another reason why they should know you before it happens Contact the first responders. This could be part of the breach coach's duties. They might deal with the first responders directly, but again, you want to have them lined up beforehand. And then really where you, uh, where you, what you do depends on, this probably should have been the first bullet to point, what you do depends on the type of incident. It depends on you know how long the attack has been going on, 
how long the virus or the, the, the hacker has been into your system, what did it actually hit, did it hit just regular old files, did it hit personally identifiable information, where are your customers located, where are you located. So, um, for example, um, it, again, it could just be a virus that hit one of your workstations. You don't have to alert all, you know, sense, you know, all the alarms don't have to go off. You don't have to include a forensic team, whatever. Um, but if it is a true breach, what do you do? So we've identified the type as a true breach. You try to contain the breach. You gather evidence. You investigate uh, what happened. Then you attempt to eradicate and then recover. It could be just restoring from backup. It could be rebuilding hardware. It could be just running the antivirus software. Uh, and then document what happened. Document how to, to stop it from happening again if you can and then monitor from there on. And one point to keep in mind here, that most of the focus that we take, and even though we, we have the responsive and the reactive uh, portion covered for uh, clients with our solution, much of the focus there is preventing it, avoiding the exposure, mm -hmm. avoiding the vulnerabilities, nipping something in the bud before it can spread and cause damage that then triggers all these other issues. So it, it, it's very much analogous to the old, you know, the best offense is a good defense. Mm -hmm. And we are, in many cases, in a defensive posture because the bad guys are constantly coming up with new wrinkles and ways to hurt us uh, for their financial gain. And our systems and our approach is a fluid one that is constantly maintaining that vigilance and vigil and helping you be aware of it. Mm -hmm. So options for implementing all of this, if we, if we start at, the, at number three there, uh, do it yourself outside consultants, uh, the, you can go out there and do your own research and find out what needs to be done and, and what products are out there and services. You could hire a consultant, maybe cost you 100 grand a year um, to do that. or for step one, we have our ACS five step cyber solution, which again starts at 150 per month, and we'll dive into a little bit more about what that actually is in just a moment. So you can you can go with our cyber solution, which is is a low cost, you know, easy to implement solution, or you can keep your head in the sand and pretend that nothing's going to happen to you, or say why do I have to prevent it? It's going to happen anyway. <laughs> Pardon me. I think we prevented some very valid reasons why you shouldn't do that. And then three, do it yourself. Uh, again, with outside consultants. So just to rehash our, our solution, again, it's easy to implement, state-of-the-art technology, and it's budget-friendly starting at $150, $150 per month versus possibly 100000 And now we're going to walk through what is contained, an overview, a brief mm -hmm. overview. Uh, we know there's a lot of information uh, being, being absorbed now. This is just to give you a brief overview of what is in each of the steps to help identify uh, what is potentially able to cause you a problem and then ways of going mm -hmm. about putting in a defense. Here they are. And again, we're, we're very proud of what we've done here with our five steps. This is actually came as a spinoff from our, our five steps to, to uh, workplace, workplace safety. safety. Dealing with OSHA, we, we realized that cybersecurity is risk management. Uh, and, and de identifying the vulnerabilities and, and then putting controls in place to protect yourself. So these five steps also apply to our workplace safety. But basically, step one, you need to know what you have and what could, what could, could happen to what you have. So identify risk and vulnerabilities. And this, you, you can do this in several ways, including our subscription is coaching the actual procedures to identify the risks and the actual tools. And, and what we do there is we actually walk a client through a question screen to help them understand, but help we help you define mm -hmm. where the risks and the vulnerabilities are. Mm -hmm. We have the experts. And so it's not like a go do it yourself, here it is. We actually uh, walk you through that. Mm -hmm. And that's in the first step. Right. And, and some companies need that you know that quote unquote first step to, to get them started on a good cyber security and good cyber hygiene that we call and doing a an assessment of what you have or identifying the risks is a key key piece of that and we'll supply the steps that you can do to to, to do that one of our subscription levels actually gives you 
a tool bundled in that will, will look at your network, your hardware, your software, and will identify the risks and vulnerabilities. But then there might be a CFO out there or CIO out there that says, or a small business owner that says, I just don't want to know the risks of my hardware and software. I need to know everything. You know, we've got people here late at night. What about people coming in, uh, you know, looking through the windows to see who's in there? Or, or what about people leaving stuff on the desks? Uh, that contains, you know, maybe they break down the password, leave it on their desk. So they need a f more full-blown risk assessment. We can give that to, to them as, as well. Uh, ACS five-step number two, step two, plans, policies, and procedures. We, we, we spoke about this again. There, there's probably 20 security policies, uh, security plans that you should be doing. Again, not everybody needs to do all of them, but you need to do at least some of them. We give you the matrix of, of what they are. Right, and, what and to in do. concert with the uh, expert on our end, your walk through which mm -hmm. ones are needed for what you do, for where you are, and which ones are prioritized and why. Mm -hmm. So it really gives you a great layout of plans, policies, procedures that when and as implemented will help avoid the exposures and the problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, we help you prioritize that. We help you schedule that through a annual planning calendar mm -hmm. uh, in a way to say, okay, let me take, can I take this in bits and pieces? Right. And that way it's, it's able to be done in bits and chunks, we'll call it, uh, of tasks that fit within your resources, timetables, mm -hmm. and budgets. And again, all the expertise is provided to hail a guide and assist you in working your way through that. Right. And one, one of the, 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 I think it's the fourth bullet point there, the post-breach response. This is well worth the price of admission. This is available at, at several of our subscription levels. Uh, it's going to give you the, the, the team of folks that are going to help you uh, respond. But again, the point is you want to get a policy or a plan in place before something happens on who does what, when, where, who to contact, so on and so forth. So this is the actual plan, but just know that our, our, our solution also gives you the actual breach coach that will st uh, step you through it. And the next step is training. And basically what we are providing at, at, at the base subscription on is access to white papers, webinars like this one, training, informational programs that can help you understand where you're vulnerable, where issues are, and these are broken up by category in a number of ways. And like every one of these steps, it's constantly updated and enhanced so that a customer has ongoing access to the latest, best information. Mm -hmm. The uh, programs also have availability uh, for online, uh, custom training, and even plan testing and review uh, uh, modules uh, to be inserted in their subscription if and as and when needed. Mm -hmm. So you could start at a basic level uh, and keep building on it as your needs dictate. Mm -hmm. and we cannot stress, again, how important and user training is your, your your employees have become part of the cybersecurity controls. They they are a, a defense. They they can be a point of entry for the bad guys, but more importantly, they can be part of the defense. And as we spoke to earlier, more and more entities that you deal with are really wanting to look over your shoulder and see what how do you train your employees so that the you're, they're not doing something that could hurt their system. Mm -hmm. Now the the next aspect of our uh, steps is step four, and that's really about monitoring and maintaining. And what we do is we, we first of all, from the step one evaluation, give you a calendar of to-dos. Like these are the type of things that you should do periodically, monthly, quarterly, etc. And how do you avoid the top issues for a company doing what you do. As we said earlier, you get access to the experts and the support group. We have in the program periodic conference calls. We help you with compliance reporting. There's the availability of units and devices that are hardware and software to give you an all-in-one approach 
uh, to monitoring your hardware, your logs, your systems, your software 24-7. And really all this does is put in a convenient package the ability to keep taking the steps that need to be taken to avoid the exposures and the issues. Right. Uh, uh, to, to kind of drive on the point again earlier from the, that important control slide, we listed security intelligence, behavioral monitoring, threat detection, all these things that you should be doing, not just antivirus and, and, and firewall. And one of those things that we discussed was the security intelligence, or what we call SIM, and log collection and correlation of the logs. Uh, if you think back to the one slide I bolded, it said 80% of organizations breached had evidence in their logs. Well, in our all-in-one USM, our Unified Security Management System, also you know as a UTM, uh, we include that security intelligence piece and the behavior monitoring piece that will examine the logs, correlate the logs, and fire off alerts to either your IT person or the business owner that says, look, something fishy is going on in here. So again, that's a, a huge component of, of our, our step four included in one of our subscription levels. And then the last step there is our record keeping. Uh, again, there's uh, plenty of reasons why you need to do this. That could be for your PCI compliance. You need to keep a detailed record. Our USM will actually kick out reports, like Robert said, that you can then keep on hand and store. Uh, you need to create an audit trail so that if you are breached, you go back and find out what you had done before your breach, during the breach, and after the breach. And then your forensics, uh, what was done as part of the forensic process needs to be uh, kept as well. And this is included, again, the, the, the mechanism for storing this information is included in the USM and then also in our, in our five-step solution. And then lastly, uh, we have the compliance, which many, many uh, states and other entities and vendors and, and relationships you have uh, require proof of records demonstrating that you've complied with what they want to see done or with what the, the rule of the law uh, dictates that you do. Right. Okay. So that rounds out our program. Uh, we want to thank you for your attendance and participation. Uh, we don't have the ability to follow up on a number of questions, but advise you that any that you have, uh, just feel free to send them to us or call us up or relay them through your uh, insurance agent or agency partner and they will get them to us and we'll follow up on them. So uh, we will provide all the questions sent to us and answers to all the program participants. Mm -hmm. So once again, I'd like to thank you for your participation and, and compliment you on your efforts to stay uh, hopefully ahead of the bad guys. Sure. Thank you, folks.